وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا Welcome back, our viewers, into another episode of your show around Kuwait, where every episode we're covering the most recent topics around our beloved country, or some of the episodes where we have a really beloved guest who are sharing their inspiring stories with us. Of course, I'm your host, Abdelatif Lanizi, and today I will take you through our journey for this episode. And of course, for today, we are honored to have with us Uthman Ibn Farooq, an esteemed American Muslim scholar and preacher who has dedicated his life to pursuit of knowledge and teaching of Islam. And of course, with that, from humbling beginnings in Pakistan to his journey throughout the United Kingdom and ultimately settling in California, Uthman's trajectory and uh, statement, his unwavering commitment to both, to both his faith and academic endeavors, with a wealth of traditional Islamic accreditations and background in information and technology management. Uthman Insight promised to enlighten us and inspire all of us to uh, your remarkable journey that you're having. So uh, Uthman bin Farooq, welcome and thank you for being here with us to share your inspiring journey. Hayyakum Allah, it's a pleasure being here in this beautiful country of Kuwait, wonderful people, great ah, food. You. Yeah, Inshallah great food. We, are, we are really struggling with that, but <laughs> we are trying to keep it up by, you know, there's a lot of foods and also there's a lot of gym. So. MashaAllah, khalas, you balance it out. <laughs> yeah, we're trying. So how is Kuwait with you first? Alhamdulillah, wonderful, wonderful. It's my first time going around Kuwait and it's been a wonderful experience. I uh, found the people very hospitable and uh, friendly and alhamdulillah very clean, organized, yeah. uh, alhamdulillah. beautiful masajid. Allahumma barik lakum, Allah, Allah, Allah bless it. Uh, so can you share with us your journey from Pakistan to United Kingdom and after that mm. you uh, went to California and how it, has it shaped your perspective uh, as an American Muslim scholar? Uh, when I was young, my family was uh, quite wealthy in Pakistan and they, my father came and studied in the United States in like the 50s and he got his masters and he went back and uh, Alhamdulillah uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote for the Qadr that we left Pakistan when I was very young and when I was about six years old we moved to the United Kingdom I lived in Manchester UK for about a year and a half then when I was around eight nine we came to the US and uh, was in a very rough neighborhood yeah. A lot of gangs, fighting, you know, all kinds of cartels. Well, of and course, you stayed away from that. No, no, I didn't stay away from it. I, I got pretty involved in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, involved. yeah, I was pretty bad. Um, you know, I got involved in gangs when I was around 10 or 12 years old. And I was, uh, until I was about 18, I didn't have any Muslim friends. I didn't know much about Islam. Grew up going to church, um, studied the Bible, you know, but Alhamdulillah, that was uh, a whole another journey. That was a very, yeah, the, you can YouTube Uthman ibn Farooq's story. There's a lot of videos about this journey. So it's uh, a lot of my friends got killed. We saw the reality of uh, America and the life in America and the violence and gangs and shootings and stabbings and drive-bys. I mean, I'm from San Diego, California, so SoCal in the 80s and 90s was very rough. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me. And uh, when I was about 18, I went on a journey to study all the different religions from Hinduism to Buddhism, Christianity, Catholicism, Judaism, every ism you can think of. Yeah. And uh, after reading and studying, I chose Islam because the only religion that was the truth, that gave me the answers that I was looking for, that uh, yani, uh, could answer all my questions with evidences from the Quran, from Sahih Ahadith and so on. So then um, I didn't want to be a career imam, take money for religion. So I got my bachelor's in computer science, started working as an engineer. Uh, but then I quit my job. I went to Rasul Khaima, I went to Jordan, Saudi to take knowledge. Then I came back to the US, worked again, got my master's in executive MBA. Then I left everything with my family, my sons, my wife, went to Pakistan to study this time and uh, I studied with some of the traditional scholars and then I enrolled in the Islamic University of Islamabad until I achieved my second master's yeah. which was in Hadith Mashallah. and uh, Alhamdulillah I came back to the US and I combined that technology and science side with Islamic sciences for the da'wah 
to explain Islam to a lot of atheists and Christians and people on the streets. And we started giving da'wah. We have uh, what's called the One Message Foundation. Yes, We have the YouTube we channel and it. so on. And alhamdulillah, we started having a lot of people accept Islam. In the last two years that we've been keeping count, we've had about 3,500 people that became Muslim. MashaAllah. Before that, we didn't keep count. So Allahu alam. But this is in the last two years, alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. You're taking all of the ajr and hasanat that they are. And Allah having. accepts it from us. MashaAllah. Tabarakallah. Eh, asallah. Eh, taqabbalah. InshaAllah. Um, this has got to be a remarkable journey that you're having. A lot of uh, stops. I mean, uh, you went from Pakistan uh, to Europe and then to America and then went back to Al Khalij and then went to Al Khalij. I don't think you've been there before. And yep. then you went back to Pakistan and then you went to America again. Mm -hmm. So that's got to be a really amazing journey that you have. Um, it's been a crazy journey, yeah, no it's, doubt. It's, it uh, is. It has been, a, let's say, uh, a whole of action. Uh, yeah, I mean, everything from getting shot at in the streets in America to studying with traditional scholars in mountainous areas in the Pukhtunfa yeah. areas and yes. and then you know, being in the streets, giving da'wah. I mean, we, will, we will reach actually to this point again. Mm -hmm. But you also, what inspired you to delve into the study of Islam uh, practically mm -hmm. during your teenage uh, years? I mean, I mean, you went, as you mentioned, you, you uh, read uh, about many, many religions, mm -hmm. but you chose Islam, you found yes. the message, but is there maybe another reason, a deeper reason, let's say, that said to yourself, okay, I, I think the answer is here. Well, I studied a lot of religions. Like I said, I mean, I studied, growing up, I studied the Bible cover to cover. Um, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And if you watch the videos from the One Message Foundation, you'll see I've marked the Bible. And it's not because I wanted to debate, it's because I wanted to learn. And I found a lot of mistakes in the Old Testament, numeric mistakes in the New Testament. If you talk about the resurrection of Jesus, you find a lot of contradictions and so on. And, and this thing also helped you to, to, let's say, to debate with other people. Of course. Uh, yeah. ab about their religion and, and mm -hmm. the Islam, right? Yeah, so I studied Judaism, for example, and I found uh, a lot of uh, racist ideas of a chosen people and yeah. everybody else being Gentile. So it didn't sit right with me. But when I came to Islam, it said, La farak bain al Arab wa Ajam. Yani, there's no difference between Arab and Ajam or white yeah. or black, illa bi taqwa, except whoever is more pious. So that, that helped, that made sense. In my heart, my fitra took to it. When I studied the Bible and it said, Jesus died for your sins, to me, it didn't make sense because, like, for example, Akhun uh, Abdul Latif, sah? Yeah. Let's say you kill somebody, may Allah never make it, but let's say... God forbid. God yeah. forbid. And then I say, you know what, you kill somebody, you murdered, but I'm going to take his son and put him to jail and I'm going to let you go. Nobody takes that as justice, right? So if humanity sure. is doing sins and then an innocent person is killed for their sins and the sinful people are free and no, not accountable, it didn't sit right with me. But when I came to Islam and Islam said, look, everybody will be judged for their own actions. Allah is Ghafoorur Rahim. He can forgive you. He doesn't need to kill his own son. Then that made sense. You know, when I studied Hinduism and they talked about worshiping cows and rats and monkeys and blue guys and statues, it didn't make sense. But when Islam said there is one Rabbul Alameen above that Laysa Kamithli Shay, there's nothing like him. He has always been there. He's not a man, woman. He's not white, black. It made sense. You know, when I studied Buddhism and I said, even if somebody attacks your wife and your daughter and is attacking them and harming them, you can't use violence to stop it. It didn't make sense. But when Islam says, no, if somebody dies protecting their mal, their shaheed, this made sense. So everything Islam, with the fitrah of insan, it makes sense. From all of the aspects. From all of the as aspects. As it is. Exactly. Even when you look at atheists, uh, we look at a lot of atheists nowadays talk about evolution. But when you look at actual science, because evolution is a theory, it's not a fact. Yeah. When you talk about inner species evolution, it's never been proven in a clinical controlled tr environment. If you look at adaptation of animals to their environment, we in Islam have no problem with that. It's Allah's al-bari, he's the one that evolves his creation. But to say insan came from a monkey, when we challenge that scientifically, and the idea of atheism that there is no God, that insan came out of nowhere, Abdul Latif, if I told you today, that this studio that we're sitting in, nobody built it. You nobody know, imagine this yeah. table, these chairs, these mics, these cameras that you it's guys it's may not see. It's been developed by itself. Over billions of years, grains of sand just made this. Would you believe me? No. Your body is more complicated than this studio. Your eyes are more complicated than that camera. 
Your ears are more sensitive, your mouth better than this mic. Your liver, your kidney, your heart, the functions within your body, white blood cells and how they heal. If you take that iPhone of yours and throw it on the ground, is it going to heal itself? No. But if you fall and you scrape your leg, do you heal yourself? Yes. Allah made that. Alhamdulillah. So the idea and of atheism aspects, didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so all of these aspects and f from all of this perspective made sense to you. And this is one of the reasons, uh, let's say, this is the reason yes. itself uh, that, that made you to, let's say, dedicate your life for, for Islam. Every question I had, Islam could answer with evidence from the Quran or Sahih Hadith. Exactly. Exactly, as, as all of us we believe in. So how do you balance your academic pursuits in information technology and technology management uh, with your dedication uh, to Islam, uh, Islamic scholarship? It's not easy. I don't sleep much. Beca beca because <laughs> a lot of shy. Yeah, a lot of shy. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I, I don't take a salary from the masjid. I mean, I, what I do for, the, for Islam is for the sake of Allah. So it's very difficult to balance working a regular job going into the office, getting that done, then coming home, having four children, homeschooling them because Mashallah the environment Allah. there is not easy. Yeah. You met my elder son Yusuf here, mashallah. Yeah, so mashallah. to raise them and then, yeah, and it takes a lot of support from the family. Of course, I have to give credit to my family, especially my mother for all that, her dua and you know, all that she has done for me. Um, but at the same time, also it's difficult, right? But Jannah is not easy, you know, Jannah is not going to come from us sitting around, you know, just wasting time and watching soccer games and things like this. So I don't want to waste time. If I have time, I want to use it for khair, for good. I have work. When I get back from work, I don't, I don't sit around. I go to the masjid. If I have a dars, I teach in the masjid for, for the sake of Allah. Yani, so then we teach. If we have da'wah, then we go out to do da'wah for the sake of Allah. We ask Allah for barakah in our awqat from our, on our time and we rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, it's, it's really hard to balance, but supporting yourself financially throughout the job and career yeah. uh, to support your journey, that's got to be something amazing. It's difficult. And, and of course, Allah, Allah yaktib lak ajal mm -hmm. uh, And of course, so can you tell us what motivated you to uh, extensively pursue in, of Islamic knowledge and how have these experiences enriched your understanding uh, of the faith? Of course, when I wanted to practice Islam, I didn't want to do it blindly, like the Christians have this taqlid of blind following. I wanted to do it ala basira and upon knowledge and, and uh, insight. And that's why... To make sense, let's say. Of course, and that's why first on I started to study the Arabic language, Nahu and Sarf and Ajrumiya and Alfiya and so on, so that I could try to understand the Quran in its original context. And then from that, I wanted to then learn what, where was the Quran revealed, what was going on, asbab al nuzul and so on, so that we could live you know, as proper Muslims implementing the Quran correctly. I saw from the Christians that I was raised with uh, a religion that was followed without any questioning, meaning Christmas. There's no Christmas in the Bible. Uh, most Christian scholars will tell you that Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. It's a marketing ploy. Santa Claus, reindeer, trees, all of that's got nothing to do with Christianity, right? So when I saw this religion that had been changed so much, I didn't want that. I wanted to follow the true religion as Allah has revealed it in the Quran, as the Prophet ﷺ had shown us. So that took knowledge. Because then if you see something bid'ah, or you see somebody doing shirk and so on, and you don't want to fall in that, then you need to have the evidences. Yes. So to study for that, then I studied Alhamdulillah, and tafsir and hadith and fiqh and so on. And it enriched me as a person because I love books. I mean, my teacher, I mean, I'm Abu Yusuf because my elder son is Yusuf. Yeah. But my teacher used to call me Abu Kutub, you know. Abu Kutub. Because I love books. And Kuwait <laughs> has amazing bookstores, by the way. Barakallah ah, thank you. Thank you. So I started to study and learn. And uh, the more I studied and learned, the more I loved it. Islam, yani the uloom of Islam, uh, each one is like a bahar. Each one is an ocean in itself. If you go into Balagha, if you go into Nahu, Sarf, you know, if you go into Tafsir, if you go into Usul al Fiqh, if you go into Ulum of Hadith, like Takhrij of Hadith, Ilm al Rijal, Allahu Akbar, it's beautiful and it's practical. It's not yes. like studying, you know, philosophy where it's just kind of, you know, useless mind games. It's something that where you can learn something and practice in your daily salah. You can learn a dhikr and use it in your dua. You can learn a hukam of salah and use it every day. 
So I loved it. And till today, I'm a talib ilm, I'm a student of knowledge, and I hope to continue my studying until Al-Qabr, inshallah, until to the grave. Uh, of, of course, about طولة Umar, inshallah, he's yeah, living Allah. long, bi-idhnillah. Uh, but of course, uh, since, since you have this uh, remarkable long journey uh, in Islam, uh, can you tell us uh, more about, let's say, some of the experience that you have, uh, let's say, a special person that, sh that you uh, let him accept Islam, mm -hmm. like some, uh, let's say, a special experience? Let's I say. mean, alhamdulillah, um, everybody that we've had uh, the gift from Allah to be able to be there for their shahada, that Allah guides people, not us, right? The, everybody that Allah made us the means to guide has been special. Because everybody is special. E Everyone. Every man, woman, child that accepts Islam, that is saved from a nar, from the hellfire, and enters inshallah. towards Jannah, inshallah, this is more valuable than anything in this world. You know, like that beautiful hadith about if a certain single person is guided through you, it's better than you, than the red camels. And the red camel was the aghla, was the most expensive thing, the most valuable thing to the Arabs. So understanding that every single person becoming Muslim has been amazing. And I always get goosebumps when somebody takes a shahada every time. Even though in the last, like I mentioned, the last two years we've got more than 3,500, but every Mashallah. time it's special. But alhamdulillah, we've had some uh, influencers, some well-known people, like there is a brother Sneeko that became Muslim in my house with us, took the shahada, and he's a da'i now, mashallah. Yes, mashallah. Yeah. mashallah. And then other people like our brother Bobby from Thailand is also a big influencer, other those people. But to me, even somebody that I don't even remember their name is just as special. Thank you. This got to be a really amazing answer. Um, in every experience, as you mentioned, there was a goosebump. So got to be, there is an amazing feeling. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. And thank you for this uh, remarkable journey. Of course, uh, Athman, we have more and more questions, but we have the short break. Shalom. So for you, our DV was stay tuned and we'll be right back. Welcome back, our viewers. Continuing our episode with our uh, Mr. Uh, with our guest, Uthman uh, Ibn Farooq. Uh, so, Mr. Uthman, Allah hayyik uh, yibgik. This is how we say it. Allah hayyik yibgik here in Kuwait. <laughs> um, can you tell us about um, your role as a scholar and a preacher uh, at the Masjid Al Rabat in San Diego, mm -hmm. California? What impact you uh, and it has uh, had on the local Muslim community? Alhamdulillah, in our masjid, we have a lot of programs for the community, for non-Muslims and Muslims. Yeah. Uh, every Thursday, we have iftar for those that are fasting. And then we invite our non-Muslim neighbors to come break the fast with us as well, not just in Ramadan, but all year round. For uh, the experience. For the say. experience to build bridges of understanding. You know? yeah. And then Saturdays, we have a dars. So I used to teach uh, Sira Nabawiya, min Ahadith al-Sahiha, the life of our beloved Prophet, peace be upon him, from the authentic sources. And uh, we have other uh, durus that we've had, like in Nahu and Aqeedah and Sarf and everything from Uloom of Hadith and so on to educate the Muslim community. So every Saturday we have a dars and then we have dinner as well for the community to gather our Muslim youth in a good environment and our non-Muslim neighbors to come and see the Muslim community and get to know us so we can dispel any misconceptions or stereotypes that the media might be putting out. So it's a very important part of okay. us Muslims living in the West to be good ambassadors of Islam, to be good representations in our mannerisms. And that's why when, when my neighbor accepted Islam recently, who was a very strong Christian Mormon, after two years of study, it was very, a very touching thing to me because you know we recorded the, him Mashallah. accepting Islam yeah. and, and he mentioned that being a good neighbor was one of the reasons that he accepted Islam. So for us, we worry sometimes if we're putting a good image in our daily life or not. So when your neighbors are accepting Islam, it's a very good sign, you know. That's, that's a good sign that you are a good neighbor. Inshallah, and, and, and inshallah, as we hope from Allah. Because uh, that's got to be really amazing. So can you tell us how, uh, about some of the aspects so a lot of people can understand of, of a right Muslim uh, being a good neighbor. How can you be a good neighbor? Of course, as the Prophet والسلام, has told us that, yes, you know, yeah. the, the one who is not, whose neighbor sleeps hungry and he's not concerned is not from us. So we need to always care about our neighbors, whether Muslim or not, to make sure that they have food, that they're okay, Doesn't that matter, they're yeah. safe. Um, you know, some of my neighbors, uh, for example, when they have, 
issues going on with medical issues and they don't have family, then we always offer to take them to the hospital or to the doctors. We have some older neighbors that sometimes need help. So we're always willing to help. We invite our neighbors to you know, learn about our religion. For example, in Ramadan, we take some halawiyat, some sweets, and we yeah. take them to the neighbors with a pamphlet about Islam. We give them free the sweets, and then we tell them, look, we're going to be fasting. We just want to share our cultural practices. And it's always a good da'wah, open up communication. Um, After a while, they yeah. will see the change and the difference. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Even, even when you first start the conversation, many times they will think, you know, I used to see on the news a very negative image of Muslims. But when I see you, my neighbor, you know, concerned about me, helping me, then, you know, we, we, we love to see the reality of Islam in real life. That, and that is a difference. That is course. a difference. And that's how we do away the negative stereotypes from the media is to show a good image in real life. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, same experience actually happened to mm -hmm. me. And of course, here in Kuwait, it's got to be happening because all of us are Muslim, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. um, what happened to me is I, I, I traveled for a few days and my car st stayed still. So my mm -hmm. neighbor called me three times, uh, but my phone was off. So he t texted me through the internet. Mm -hmm. He told me like, Alif, are you okay? Is everything okay? Your car didn't leave. Uh, like, uh, is everything okay? I told him, mm. no, no, I'm just traveling. If you want anything from outside, just tell me. Yeah. He said, no, no, I was afraid that you have something. Maybe there's a situation or something. You, you wasn't home. Mm. So that's, that's got to be amazing that we are still the same as Muslims, even when you're outside, no matter how what your neighbor is, like, um, no matter for the religion that they're adopting, it's always got to be same aspect, same actions that we do. Yes, this is what the religion teaches us, to be good neighbors, to be good productive citizens of society, to help people. I work in the medical device industry, and I had many chances to go to other industries with my qualifications, but I stayed because in the end it helps people, it saves lives. You know, I developed a product uh, as a quality and regulatory engineer at the time that uh, helped people that would have hypothermia or a stroke. So, subhanAllah. MashaAllah. Um, there was a letter that a girl from Michigan wrote because she had fallen in a frozen lake and she would have a hypothermia and died yeah. but because the product the company I worked with made it saved her life you know from Allah of course Allah. from the suburb yeah. so she's not Muslim she doesn't know who I am but she wrote a letter to our company and I, I keep that letter with me you know to encourage us that look you know when you do something no matter what you're doing as long as you're doing it mukhlisan lillah for the sake of Allah, then yani, the good impact that you have, you should never forget and it should encourage you to do more good. Uh, remarkable answer, remarkable I'm not going to lie. So, s throughout your journey, uh, as you told us, that you went uh, th through your um, neighbors in the neighborhood, uh, giving them, let's say, sweets while you were practicing uh, Islam and fasting. Uh, and of course, through these actions, there are some of some, some people doesn't accept it as you might think. Sure. So there might be danger. Um, however, um, like, um, have you ever been in danger? Uh, while uh, yeah. preaching Islam, and how did you deal with it? Um, well, if you look up Uthman ibn Farooq, then you will find on YouTube, uh, I got stabbed um, in Alhamdulillah America. Salam, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Tawakkalna Allah. Um, and we've been attacked multiple times, sometimes while giving da'wah, you know, because not everybody has the ability to have a polite conversation. Some people, because they're unable to use their words and to back up what they're saying, they resort to violence. But for us, we don't respond to violence with violence. Instead, we use the wisdom of still any, giving them the proper message of Islam True. and being patient because that's what our beloved Prophet Wasallam taught us. When you look at the Prophet Wasallam in Taif, he was attacked and he was bleeding, but he didn't go make dua for the destruction of the people of Taif. Instead, he made dua for their guidance. So for me, even if somebody and he attacks us or yeah. speaks ill, we make dua for them. We ask Allah to guide them. We ask Allah to and he make us a means of their guidance because sometimes they're just ignorant and we want to educate them. We want to share True. with them the truth yes. about the beautiful religion of Islam. Um, uh, so um, is there like um, sometimes when you are preaching Islam and you are trying to spread it, uh, mm. 
after the attacks do you sometimes get like scared or no. like you're afraid why scared of what death yeah we're all gonna die true <laughs> i'm a muslim true. i believe every soul will taste death i'm not and afraid of anybody but allah and and of, and of and of course what you are doing during the attack is actually what's the most important thing i mean if someone dies while they are uh, in mecca someone Shahada. dies while they are uh, f of course while they are praying um, that's got to be something really alhamdulillah the, the first thing that we say alhamdulillah husn al khatima um, so as someone with a, with a deep understanding of uh, hadith science how do you approach to uh, the interpretation uh, and ap uh, the application of hadith in contemporary uh, context of course uh, the ulum of hadith are such beautiful excellent science when you look at ilm al rijal looking at the biographies of each narrator and then in hadith yes. it's not just okay you look at one aspect you look at ittasal of sanad the chain being connected adl al rawi the moral character of the narrator dabt al rawi the precision of the character you look at shudud if there's something contradictory or not you look at ilal wording or inner textual defects it's such a beautiful science that many of the western sciences would not be able to compete with it so when we learn those sciences of hadith like the Sahih of Bukhari and Muslim and their shurut and so on, you appreciate the work the great scholars of the Sunnah, of the scholars of hadith, the likes of Bukhari and of Dirmidhi and Ibn Majah and Nisai and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and others have done. And when you learn that, then you implement those hadith in your life knowing well that this is what the Prophet, peace be upon him, he showed us. And that's very rare because today, if I was to ask a Christian, you know, where is the sanad, the chain for your narrations of the Bible to Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him. We love Isa ibn Maryam, but they yes. don't have that chain. So they make up a religion, they fabricate things, you know. But in Islam, Allah has blessed us with this ilm rijal and takhreej and understanding so we can know exactly, even today when we pray, we pray knowing this is what Allah has ordered in the Quran what the Prophet ﷺ has shown us, every aspect of our prayer, we can show you a hadith from it, from sujood to ruku to wada al yadain to all of that. Yes. You can look at a hadith. You don't just make things up, right? And that's something beautiful. If you look at other uh, traditions, for example, Buddhism, you cannot show me a sanad to Buddha for anything. Hinduism, you cannot show me a chain of, of narrations to Ram or Sita or any of that, right? So when I studied those religions, and then I studied the Islamic sciences, I realized Islam is the truth. I realized that this is the only religion preserved, mahfuz, with Quran manuscripts. I mean, for example, we have Qurra, Huffad, that memorize the Quran. Ramadan is coming, inshallah. Insha Our ulema. Ramadan is here, as yeah. of the first episode of Ramadan. Allahu Akbar. So it's so beautiful. Mubarak. It's beautiful. Yes. Allah mubarak lana wa lakum wa Allah mutaqabal minna wa minkum. Amen. Shahr Ramadan, Shahr Baraka. So this month of Ramadan, we hear the Quran being recited by those people from their memories in every masjid around the world. Now this is a miracle. We challenge any Christian, Catholic, anybody to bring somebody who has memorized the whole Bible. One person. Two billion plus Christians and Catholics in the world even the Pope or their big priests have not memorized the Bible word by word, letter by letter. But you go to Pakistan, you see seven-year-old little kids that have memorized the whole Quran. You go to Kuwait, mashallah, you see competitions, young children competitions, memorize yes. the whole Quran. Mashallah, yes. mabarak lahum. Every Ramadan. Allahi, in the Khalid, we see uh, a lot of dedication to the Quran and to the people of the Quran. And may Allah bless the people here for that dedication of the Quran and to Ahadith and the Awqaf, mashallah here, they've done an amazing job also printing a lot of very valuable books that I have benefited from myself. That's, that's really magical. Every answer that you are giving us, you're giving me the goosebumps that you are just Hayyakum mentioning. Allah. Uh, so, uh, getting back to, to the career that you have, uh, uh, you had challenges during your journey. So, uh, of course. Uh, 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 as an Islamic uh, preacher uh, uh, on the West, uh, mm. tell us about the challenges that you had and how did you address them? There's a lot of challenges. Of course, when you want to do something good, it's always going to be difficult. Nothing worth doing is easy. You know? 
So sure. when, you, when you go out to the street and you try to speak to people for their benefit, you don't want money from them, you don't want anything from them, you want to benefit them by connecting them to their creator, to figuring out their purpose of their creation, it's difficult because people don't want to listen. Sometimes people want to be rude. Sometimes people will spit on you. Sometimes people will curse at you. Sometimes people will physically hit you. I mean, I've been attacked more than once, you know, with weapons and so on. But we always have to go back to the Sira Nabawiya, the beautiful example of our beautiful Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, how beautiful of an example yeah. he set for us, where he showed us how to be patient. When the people in Mecca, his own family, would attack him, they would throw the guts, the intestines of the camel on his back while he's peacefully praying. He didn't curse at them, he didn't attack them, he was patient and he still delivered the message to them. So taking that beautiful life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and implementing into our da'wah is how we conquered that challenge. When somebody uh, you know, is rude, we, we show them the patience of Islam. If somebody wants to take advantage, we stand up like rijal, men. We're not somebody to be pushed around. We don't True. turn the other cheek. You know? True that. So you'll see, sometimes you have to tell people, you know, you mess around with us, We'll, we'll put you in your place. We'll knock you out because we don't play. Respect. But <laughs> they're how, that's how we do it, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, if somebody's respectful, then we are more respectful to them. And alhamdulillah, our da'wah is not a da'wah of weakness either, you know, because Islam doesn't teach us to be weak. It tells us to be strong, but just and fair and, and, and good to people. We also have other challenges. Sometimes, you know, it's an issue where we, we don't get funding from a lot of places. But Alhamdulillah, we have tawakkal Allah. We ask Allah, Allah always opens a way for us. You know, sometimes you have a challenge where people want to cancel you, you got the cancel culture. But we don't worry, we speak the haqq, we speak the truths, what Allah has revealed in the Quran, what Al-Mustafa alayhi salatu has shown us yes. in yes. his uh, sunnah. Yani, and then we stick to that, and Alhamdulillah, every challenge that comes, we ask Allah and Allah removes the challenge from us. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for this great answer. Barakallah uh, Atman ibn Farooq, uh, our beloved guest. Of course, we have more and more questions, but we have the show to break one more time. No problem. And then we'll be back. So for you, our DV was stay tuned and we will be right back. Welcome back, our viewers. Continue our interview with our beloved guest, Mr. Atman Ibn Farooq. So, um, Mr. Atman, welcome back. Barakallah feekum. Thank you. Oh, barakallah feek. Uh, after, after this beloved question that you gave us during this remarkable interview, uh, could you shed the light on the concept of uh, da'wah and the importance of the spreading the message of Islam, especially in the multifactorial uh, science uh, like the United States? MashaAllah. Societies, I mean, yeah. Yeah, uh, so in a multicultural society, we appreciate everybody's cultural values, right? Yeah. In America, if somebody is from Mexican heritage and they have, they speak Spanish and they have their own cuisine, we appreciate that in Islam, we are not here to take somebody's culture away. Islam is more about your relationship with your creator. And that's very important because if you look at society, how would we know right from wrong if we don't have a objective right and wrong. Meaning if you make everything subjective, then anybody can think, for example, you have a nice watch, Allahumma barik lak. Thank you. Right? A gift for my wife. May Allah bless you yeah. and your wife. She has good taste. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so if I was to steal your watch, is that right or wrong? Well, obviously we would think it's wrong. Yeah. Why? Because the Quran makes it haram for us to steal. The Prophet والسلام, he forbid us from stealing. Yes. But if we don't have that objectiveness, then I could say, I want to watch, it's okay. Capitalism, big fish eats little fish, I can take it from you, right? Then, it, then there is no True. values, right? Whether you look at many other uh, yani questions that society comes with, when we want to look at something subjective, then people have their own views. But when you look at something divine, then it's objective, there is a reason. So in a multicultural society like the West, whether it's the UK or America, when we present Islamic values, we are not there to take somebody's culture away. We're there to present an idea of how to connect the creation with the creator. And that divine creation connection, that spiritual aspect is needed. 
In fact, in the West, it's more needed than ever. Here in Kuwait, mashallah, may Allah bless the Kuwait of Kuwait, the people of Kuwait, we see a, 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 qina, a, a satisfaction in people when they meet each other, when they greet each other, when you go to society, when a family gets together, how you respect the elders, how you have uh, you know, family gatherings, how you solve problems amongst yourselves. That's why it's such a beautiful, safe society. You can walk around at 2 a.m. in Kuwait and feel safe. Yes. Uh, and most and of the Khalij countries as well, Qatar and Emirat and so on, and Saudi, may Allah bless all the lands of the Muslims. And you see a safety and a relaxed environment. You don't have that in the West. If you go and walk around in the wrong neighborhood in the U.S. at night, you will not walk around, walk back, you know. You look Last at the, walk, maybe. Yeah, look at the crime rates, the rape rates, the murder rates in America. America and the West needs Islam. They yeah. need that peace. So we as ambassadors of Islam, in a peaceful way, we present that to the society. And when we see people become Muslim, we see their lives improve. We see those neighborhoods get better. Some of the neighborhoods, for example, in Detroit and so on, that had the worst crime, it became better with Islam. Let me tell you one very important, uh, true, actual story. There yeah. is a place in Chicago called O Block. And you can Google Uthman ibn Farooq O Block and you can see the video. And this is one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in all of America. And it's in South Chicago. And uh, murderers and 14-year-old and kids with guns shooting each other is common. Yes. So I wanted to go there to give da'wah. And people told me, you're crazy. Like, you're they're going to kill you. You know, it's a dangerous, like, you know, so not somewhere, if you're not from there, you don't go there. And I told them, I'm not, I don't fear anybody but Allah, so we're going to go. So I went to Chicago and I told some of the Muslim brothers, I want to go to O Block. They told me, why do you want to go to O Block? We, exactly. we, stay, why? we stay away. I said, because they need Islam. We want to help them. We want to improve them. We want to make them have a better life. We don't want to just look down on them and shun them away. So we went there and on the way the police stopped us. And they, they stopped us, you know, where are you going? So we're going to Oblak. They said, you don't want to go there. When we were trying to set up our table for our outreach, for da'wah, the police came. One police lady, she said, I'm worried about you. I told her, don't worry about me, I have Allah. Alhamdulillah, we started to give da'wah. In a couple of hours, in one day that we were there, just for a few hours, we had 20 people accept Islam. MashaAllah. Even a police officer became Muslim. And if you check the One Message Foundation, you'll see the videos. The police officer said, who are you people that you're not scared to come here? So we're Muslim. Even though we're different races and different colors and different backgrounds, we're together. So when we gave the da'wah and so many people became Muslim, the neighborhood changed. There is a small documentary another channel made that showed that after those people becoming Muslim, they started to pray Jum'ah ah inside O Block. And they started to have salah and more people became Muslim and the crime rate dropped. And even the police and the mayor there appreciated Islam helping that area. There's a documentary somebody else has made online about this. So what does that tell you? Our contribution to society is to improve society. If you look at the safest cities in the world, they're all Muslim. And if you look at the most dangerous cities in the world, they're not Muslim. they need Islam. Yes, they need it. For sure. Thank you. MashaAllah, I met a few of uh, two hours, like more than 20 people. That's got to be a really an amazing number in changing people's life. I mean, how many lives saved after uh, you are preaching them? And thank you. Thank Barakallah. you, Mr. Rahman. So, in your opinion, what role can technology play in, uh, let's say, fa facilitating Islam uh, education and outreach efforts? Excellent. Um, the world is the world of technology today. We as Muslims have to embrace it and utilize it and, and make our lives and our countries and our societies better and at the same time utilize that technology for da'wah. And alhamdulillah, we have da'wah in, on the streets, in the parks, we go out, we speak to people, you see the videos. But more people are becoming Muslim online now than in person because people like yourself, our sisters, many of them sitting at home in their abaya, in their niqab, in their hijab, are sitting inside 
and they, we don't even know who they are. They're doing it for the sake of Allah. They're not paid by us. They take those videos, they make clips, they post them on Instagram, on TikTok, on different platforms, Snapchat, whatever else. I don't even know these platforms myself. I don't even have a lot of social media myself, but those people are utilizing young shabab, kids, youth, instead of wasting time on the internet, they're utilizing the technology for da'wah and that is doing an amazing job of bringing people to Islam. We get people from Finland, from China. I just had one guy who was in China, uh, an American, but studying there, yeah. and he learned about Islam in China by watching our videos because somebody shared our videos. Then he flew to San Diego and accepted Islam with us. You know, we have people in South America, people in different parts of the world, that because of technology, they're learning about Islam. We want to, inshallah, in the future, develop apps for dua to be able to use and for new Muslims to be able to use. Inshallah, when Allah yeah. gives us the tawfiq yes, the, yeah. and the finances, we will utilize them to utilize technology to go future with the da'wah. Technology is a tool. You can is use it tool. for bad, you can use it for good. For good yeah. We want to use it for good. Uh, and, and even through your, uh, through your YouTube channel, it changed a lot of people's life. People in other and other countries uh, didn't meet you in person, but watching out your videos, watching the change that you are uh, and the impact that you're having uh, changing their life. And, and it, it is. I mean, I've, we've always been hearing by our mothers, our families, that technology only bad things yeah. and 90% bad things coming out of it. It's no good, mm. but if, if everything, as, as you mentioned, and thank you for that, it is a tool at the end. I mean, there's no going back from it. Exactly. Uh, I mean so it let's use it in the good thing. Exactly. If we don't embrace the future, then we're going to be left in the past. And Islam is not about the past. Islam is about the future because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us for the da'wah till the day of judgment. So, yes. We, we still write books and we still give durus, but when we use those books online, we can spread it to so many more people. If we use those durus, in my masjid, when I have lessons, we record them, we post them. And if we have 40, 50 people sitting in front of us in the masjid, we have 10,000 people watching online. So we True. utilize the, the media and the uh, social media and technology to spread khair, to spread good. And this is one of the reasons that you wanted to be a... Uh, uh, in technology that you can combine uh, Islam and preach. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. No, yeah. my parents gave me two choices in life. You can be a doctor or engineer. In Pakistanis, we get two choices. You know, not a lot yeah. of choices. So, <laughs> doctor or engineer. And I didn't really but feel good. like. Yeah, I didn't feel yeah. like going to med school, so I went to the computer engineering side. Uh, but you know, uh, you know, because I, I don't want to. I don't want to fake. It was khira, let's I, say. I don't believe in being fake. You know, I'm going to be honest, right? But alhamdulillah, sure. even though I didn't go into technology for that reason, but my work, especially in the medical field, has helped me a lot in da'wah. Because when I speak to people, for example, atheists that say there's no God, and then I explain to them the miracle of the human body, the miracles around us, the miracles of the Qur'an, the scientific so facts of the Qur'an. you even studied med at, at the med school? Well, I didn't go to med school, but I, I work in the medical field. So I work with uh, medical devices that are used. Oh, an engineer for the medical devices? Yes, I'm in quality okay. and regulatory. So I work in clinical trials. So when they, when they do a clinical trial, for example, and I see the adaptation yeah. of a virus and a, and a bacteria and how it works, it's amazing. I mean, if you look at the coronavirus, as, as, as scary as it was, if you see how it works, it is something amazing, though, right? How Allah made this creation that we couldn't replicate, you know? We couldn't make something like it. So we ask, for example, I was in a conference, a medical conference, and we had a PhD who was a professor at UCSD uh, University in San Diego, and she was presenting about the coronavirus and how it developed and how it morph uh, and e evolves and so on. Yeah. And I told her, is there any technology that we've developed that's like it? She said, no. I said, okay, could the technology we have, like nanobots and have come by itself? She said, no. So I said, how could this have come by itself? without any design. She said it couldn't. Couldn't. Asking Even the right question sometimes, giving them the right answer. Yeah. So then we tell her <laughs> that is Allah. Yeah, you know. true. 
الحمد لله for everything. Mm. Uh, can you share any memorable experience that you had during your travel in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and also the UAE uh, in search of Islamic knowledge? Alhamdulillah. Uh, I mean, when I was in uh, the UAE, for example, we had great experiences, met great scholars, great people. When I was in Jordan, Allah, I had a, a very good time in Amman. I was in an area called Umm Nawara. Um, when I went to, uh, I go to Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah, very often because I try to uh, any, at least go for Umrah once a year, if not more. And alhamdulillah, I went for Hajj two times. And I've never had a bad experience there, alhamdulillah. And my time in Kuwait has also been wonderful. Memorable experiences, there's always any, even when I would go to study, for example, a lot of times, um, because I didn't take any loans, I didn't take any scholarships, I would work, save money, and I would go. And sometimes, yes, any, I when I came to study, I had about $30,000, that's all I had. And then I had rent, and then I had obviously pay for food, and car, and gas, and and when I finished over a year and a half, and, and I mean, I didn't leave cheap. I mean, I went out to eat restaurants. I still had 20 something thousand left. So I was shocked. Like, I didn't even understand how that happened. Nobody understood, you know, but it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is barakah, you know. So when I would go and sit with scholars um, yani, and, and look at their memory and their ability and, you know, and, and more than anything, their humbleness, you know, how, Somebody who's famous and knowledgeable is also very humble and down to earth. Uh, it, it impressed me a lot. And, uh, you know, knowing people throughout life who are not sincere. A lot of time in the West, when we're raised there, everybody's got their own angle. When you come to yes. uh, the Khalij and you see somebody who doesn't know you and they invite you to their diwaniya or they invite you for food, and he, it shows the, the muhabba, the love that the people in these areas have. Barakallah feekum. Barakallah feek, Uthman ibn Farooq, Mr. Can, can you, like, do you have one last message, one last thing to share sure. for our dear viewers before we finish, and also something to say about Ramadan, like a simple message. Hayyakum Allah, um, As a message, and it's yeah. nasihatan for myself, first and foremost, as advice for myself, uh, life is very short. We don't really know. You know. I have friends that I grew up with that died at 12 years of age, 14 years of age. Every day we have janais, we go to the graveyards, we pray janaz on people, sometimes young people, an accident happens. It right. doesn't have to be that you're going to live 80, 90, 100 years. So don't put off doing good. Don't procrastinate. If you want to go for hajj, don't say when I get old. You don't or know next if you'll year. get old. Or Try next to go year. this year. Go when you can. If Allah give you the ability, go. Instead of going on vacation to Paris, go go for Umrah. And instead of taking that money and wasting it on any useless things, things of show, give Brands. sadaqah. And yeah. Do something that will be there for you in the Akhirah. And use your time wisely. Time is more important than money. We, today we say, I'm killing time. Why would you kill time? It's the most valuable asset you have. The one, if you have a lot of money and you lose it, you might get it back. Mm -hmm. But when you lose time, you'll never get it back. Use your time with the Quran. Use your time with da'wah. Use your time, even if you're going to sit online, don't watch useless things. Watch da'wah videos, watch durus, watch halaqat. Take the knowledge, use the yeah. time on if that. If you're going to share with your friends, don't send them funny, stupid videos like this. Send them something beneficial. Yeah. When you sit with somebody, discuss something of benefit. So use your time wisely. And this is very, very important because you don't have anything as valuable as time. And there is something that you can use or it will be against you. If you don't use it to make something, it will break you, it's time. Inshallah. So we ask Allah to pr protect us in the month of Ramadan especially, Inshallah. as a yes. special message for the people, for myself and everybody watching for the month, this blessed month of Ramadan, is that we utilize this month as a gift from Allah. You know, if you work, and I tell you, you're going to make $100 an hour if you work at this time, but if you come for overtime, I'll pay you a 1000 right? Everybody will take $1,000 an hour. Sure. Of course, I want to work more and more. Give me more overtime, right? But this, this is the overtime is, that we have in Ramadan. This is the Ramadan. Our overtime, yeah. but Allah will increase our barakat and rewards 
give more sadaqah, read more Quran, pray more Qiyamul Layl, but make it as a guide for the rest of the year. Not just in Ramadan, in the khalas after Eid, you're like, oh, party time. No, <laughs> we're Muslim all year long. <laughs> Allah is the same Allah in Sha'ban and Shahwal. This is the month of Ramadan is our training to then utilize for the rest of the year. Amazing. So we hope from Thank Allah you. that we use, utilize this blessed month of Ramadan to benefit ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Atman. Karamakallah. Jazakallah khair. You're welcome, uh, we are, Ya Rab. Uh, thank you for this remarkable interview, giving us your journey, giving us all of the information that you had. It's got to be really amazing, touching yeah, all of us. Thank you one more time for it's being here. It's been a pleasure. And once again, for the people of Kuwait, I've seen uh, great hospitality and very good manners and very loving environment yeah. and a very safe and beautiful place. And we hope that Allah blesses it and the people of Kuwait and the Khalij and the, all of the Muslim world and may Allah protect all our brothers and sisters around the world. And may Allah make us as true living examples of Islam so we can show the world what a beautiful religion Islam Inshallah. is. Inshallah. Thank you. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِّمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ